everyone. Hey everyone, my name is Emily Glankler. Welcome to this AP World History last minute review. We are less than a week away from the AP World History exam. And so today I'm gonna to give you a little bit of an overview of um, what I think you should be doing over this next week and what I think you should be not doing over this next week. For those who are new, this is Marco Learning. You should definitely be subscribing and liking what they do. We're gonna have a lot more like live reviews um, throughout this next week. I'm gonna be going live again the night before the exam on this channel, so make sure that you subscribe. And then I also have my own accounts called Anti-Social Studies. And so I have a TikTok account, Anti-Social Studies, and an Instagram and a website um, where I cover AP World. That is like my expertise. So if you are just finding Marco Learning or me, make sure that you go and subscribe to our channels because this next week we will be your best friends. Then you can unfollow me after the AP exam if you really want to. So with that, um, please use the chat wisely. Um, we will do our best to kind of keep up with the chat and answer questions. This is just a 45 minute kind of recap overview of what the exam is going to look like and what I think you should be studying this next week. Um, again, we're going to be doing more in-depth reviews and especially a like last minute review the night before the exam. So um, with that, I guess I just want to start off by showing you two really great resources um, that if you don't already know about, you should. So on this screen, you can see um, we have Marco Learning. They have a website that has a ton of free resources. The best resource that's going to be your best friend for the next week is this Marco Learning. It's a free study guide. And so let me just show you this for a second. Uh -oh. um, let me make sure I didn't just, I think I just removed that. Hold on. Let me reshare. It's been a really long time since I've been on Zoom, which has been kind of nice actually. So they have these free AP World study guides um, and you'll see as I zoom through it, like they give you, it's only 19 pages long. So it's really condensed. They're gonna give you each unit in, you know, this is unit one, it's maybe what, two pages. Um, then each unit is gonna be around two pages. They give you some images. They bold some specific terms that you'd wanna know. So if you're not really sure where to start, if you haven't really done a lot of reviewing as of right now, this is a great place to start. You can read this 19 page document. I would not go back and reread your entire textbook. That sounds awful, right? Now, if you've already been doing some reviewing and you feel okay on content, but you need a, like to understand the bigger picture or you want some more practice questions, I have on my website, this is antisocialities.org, I have a few resources for sale. I have a lot more free resources on my website and on my TikTok. On my TikTok, I've literally gone through the entire AP World History course, literally through TikToks. But I also have some extra writing prompts if you want more practice. I have some timelines, unit reviews. So again, these are all the things I would be maybe looking at to help you review over the next week. Okay, enough selling things. So what I wanna to do today is I want to make sure we're all clear on what the test is gonna look like, but most importantly, I'm gonna share with you my strategies for each section, just kind of big picture. We're not gonna be able to go into like a ton of detail about like what is um, complexity or what is additional evidence. I can answer some questions that y'all have, but Marco Learning and I both on our YouTube channels have tons of videos that like go way in depth on the different points. Um, associated with the writing and the essays. So I'm just going to give you my big picture overview. So the first is multiple choice. Um, again, you're going to have 55 multiple choice in 55 minutes. And I want to make sure that we're really clear about this. Like between now and the test, you are not going to get to the point where you can like answer all 55 multiple choice questions perfectly. It's not really the way the test is designed. I do think it's always helpful to do some practice um, multiple choice questions, especially if you haven't done them in a while in your class, just because they're kind of funky, right? They're kind of weird. And so this is a good way to just remind yourself of like what those questions are going to look like. I think one of the best ways, if you struggle with this section and you want to do some work on this over the next week, one of the best things you can do is just like go get a review book, get so a practice test, get some practice answers, and then just like look at what the right answer is, right? Any practice book you get is going to have an answer key at the end and just understand the reasoning and the explanation of why that answer is the right one. Because you'll start to recognize similar types of questions. You'll start to recognize patterns. But just as a reminder, if you are um, doing any practice multiple choice or when you get to the test on Thursday, 
eliminating wrong answers is your best friend, right? And then you're probably going to get down to two. Just a friendly reminder that on these AP history exam questions, they tend to make multiple accurate statements. So one of the things that's really hard about these multiple choice questions is you might have two or three answer choices that you're like, but these are all right. These are all true. Yes, but they don't all answer the question you're being asked. So pay attention to that. Um, on the day of the test, you can bring in pens and highlighters. You can like annotate the question to make sure you really clearly know what are they wanting me to answer. And so pick the correct answer choice that like answers that specific question. And then here's my little like trademark Emily Glankler antisocial studies tip. Let's say you're just like totally stuck. Let's say you're taking the exam. You have like three minutes left and you have to just guess on a few that you've kind of skipped and then come back to then honestly, just know that they don't ever give you a document that is meaningless. They don't ever give you a document that will not help you at all. So if there's one of the answer choices that just has more to do with the document they gave you, pick that one. And if you're really stuck, pick the answer choice you have left that's the most vague, right? So if you have an answer choice that's like, um, East Asian states dramatically increased their local manufacturing from the blah, 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 from 1200 to 1450 versus trade gradually increased during this era, the second answer choice is more likely right because it's saying less, it's less likely to be wrong. Okay. The other strategies I just want to make sure that we're clear on is like these SAQs, right? These SAQs are short. And so literally like your job is just to identify a specific answer to the question and then describe that answer in, an, in enough detail that the grader knows you know what you're talking about. Get a lot of great questions from students about like, what's the difference between describe and explain? I don't, I wouldn't, I would treat them all the same. Basically, if it just says identify one, so let's say it says identify one example of a ruler using monumental art and architecture to legitimize their rule, for example, um, then, okay, you just have to identify. One example was Versailles, which was built by the King of France to house the nobility so that they were all kind of tied to him. That's all you need to do. Anything else, explain, describe, compare, whatever. Just treat it almost like a very short little body paragraph in an essay, right? So make sure that you add one or two more sentences really clearly explaining how that example you just gave connects back to the question they're asking, right? So you might add a sentence being like, by forcing the nobility to live with him at Versailles, the King of France was consolidating his power by removing them from their feudal lands and making sure he could watch over them in case of a potential rebellion, right? You're just basically adding like one more sentence in to make sure that you fully answered the question. Okay, there was a great question in the chat. Um, what if we change our minds on what we wanted to say or the answer we wanted to pick? So on the multiple choice, you're going to be doing that in, I believe, pencil. And so, yeah, you can go back and change it. And like, that's totally fine. Um, on all the writing, you do have to write in pen. So I just want us to emotionally prepare for that fact because I, I don't like it either, but you have to write in pen. And so it's going to be messy. So just be aware that, um, let's say you're writing an SAQ. So let's say that you are answering that question about consolidating power and you're halfway through writing about Versailles and then you're like, oh, the Taj Mahal. I actually want to talk about the Taj Mahal. Honestly, I would just stick with Versailles. There's, there's no, on the SAQs, there's no like better answer or weaker answer. You either answer the question or you don't. So what I always tell students is that on the short answer question, it's about quant, it's about speed, right? You have to answer a lot of little questions. And so what I always tell students is you should just go with your first correct answer, not your best answer, right? So on that question about rulers trying to consolidate their power from 1450 to 1750, for example, you could sit there for five minutes and think of all the examples and which one's the best and which one do you feel like you could explain the best. I wouldn't do that on the SAQ. I would, I would just think of the first one that comes to your mind that is from the time period and relates. I would just go with it and move on. Now, let's say you get done answering that question about Versailles, but then you panic and you're like, wait, was that from the earlier time period? Oh no, was that the wrong one? Well, you could just leave that and then you could add another answer and be like, also, and then talk about the Taj Mahal. 
Um, there's no place on the rubrics for graders to take points away from you. So let's say that on that question that I'm making up about one-way rulers are legitimizing their rule. Let's say you did a whole thing about the Crusades. Oh, kings would like call upon their knights to go off crusading for them, blah, 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 blah. And then you realize, oh, shoot, that's from the 1200s, 1300s. That's the wrong time period. You can go cross it out and write a new answer. I would just, I would just add another answer, right? And so I would just add another answer because it's like, might as well keep it on the page, right? And say, but actually one other example from 1450 to 1750 is the Taj Mahal. It's the same thing on the essays, right? I don't think you should ever go back and just fully erase, which you can't do, but like, or cross out part of your essay because worst case it's wrong and it doesn't count against you, right? But you might actually be doing something that you don't realize. So you might have written something out and be thinking this is gonna be counted as evidence. And then you go back and you're like, oh, shoot, it's not from the time period. Don't cross that out. Leave it in there because guess what? The grader might count it as context, right? So again, what I always suggest to students is like, when in doubt, put it on the page. When in doubt, kind of leave it up there and just add to it. One last thing for um, the SAQ, a good question. Is it okay if like you use similar examples? Um, yeah, that's fine. You can treat each question separately. Normally the prompts are different enough that it's probably gonna be hard to use the exact same answer, right? So um, in this question about consolidating power, and I'll move on to a different example for my other slide. Let's say question A was like, identify one way rulers used monumental art and architecture. And you talked about the Taj Mahal in India. And then maybe you, maybe the next, maybe B is like, identify one way rulers used religion to legitimize their rule. Well, you might talk about Akbar and his divine faith. For both of those, you're talking about the Mughal empire. That's totally fine. But you're like tailoring your example to that specific question. Right. So it's pretty rare that they would ask two questions that can be answered identically. But in theory, you could talk about the Taj Mahal multiple times. But again, it's it's how you explain. It's how you like link the Taj Mahal, for example, to the specific question they're asking you. Right. And again, the difference between describe and explain. I don't actually think there is that big of a difference. If you want to know technically, technically describe like you don't have to put in your own analysis but I just think it's such a weird line. Like I just tell all my students that unless it just says identify, if it only says identify one, then you just identify and kind of define what you're talking about. Anything else, describe, explain, any other verb, I would just do the full thing. I would identify your answer. The Taj Mahal was one, or Akbar's divine faith was one way rulers try to use religion. Um, then you kind of describe what the divine faith was, just prove you know what you're talking about. The divine faith was an attempt to mix multiple religions together, the different religions of India together into one unifying religion. Um, this would have legitimized Akbar's, or it helped legitimize Akbar's rule because he was seen as a tolerant ruler, even though he historically was a Muslim ruling over a Hindu majority. I would just do that for all of them. Two to three sentences for all of them, just to make sure, because again, you, you don't wanna leave anything off the page. So what I tell my students is like on the SAQ section, you're going to be answering three full SAQs, which kind of means nine little mini questions. So what I tell my students is approach it like the multiple choice, go through and answer the questions you feel good about, then go back and do the ones you're like struggling with. Then before time is up, any of the ones that you feel like, yeah, I had an answer for that, make sure you've like fully explained that answer because you would hate to like know the answer and say the Taj Mahal and have that be right, but leave the greater wondering if you know what you're talking about. So again, the AP exam is the time to be a little bit obnoxious. It's the time to be like, just in case you weren't convinced I know what I'm talking about, let me add one more sentence clarifying it. Because there will be a lot of times where the answer might seem obvious, so that maybe they say like, describe one new commercial practice from 1200 to 1450 that expanded trade routes. And you say one commercial practice that expanded trade routes was the use of paper money. And to you, you're like, I know how that expanded it. That makes perfect sense. The grader knows, but it's like that friends episode. They don't know if you know, right? They don't know you. And so don't make them guess. 
be very like clear and kind of like transparent about it. Paper money was lighter than metal coins. And this allowed traders to travel further distances and carry more goods, you know, whatever, right? So again, I wouldn't worry too much about all the different verbs. I would just make sure you have a specific answer and make sure you've explained fully um, how it relates, right? So how long should an SAQ be? Like it could be two sentences. I think two to four sentences is great, right? Um, and again, it can be as long as you want. The only limitation on the exam is they give you for each SAQ, including ABC, they give you basically one piece of lined paper. So that's your only limitation is that space. Um, but again, you can answer the short answer questions in whatever order you want. Um, so again, you can go through and answer the ones you feel confident about. There's another great question in the chat about um, what if you don't know an answer? Well, let's say you skim through and you see that question about commercial practices and trade routes and you're like, I don't know what that means. Skip it and go answer the other ones and then come back and put in a guess, right? So let's say you're not entirely sure what commercial practices mean, but you can think of innovations that led to trade routes. And so let's say you're like, well, I'm not sure if like the camel saddle is a commercial practice. I don't know put it in there. Like you don't want to leave any of the SAQs blank. Keep in mind, I saw um, Phoebe's asking a really good question about like, what's the, a good score for the SAQ. If you're getting, if you're getting six out of the nine, like if you're getting two thirds of those answers, right, you're doing a really good job, like really good. So don't panic, right? If you see one that you're just like, I can't really think of a good example, put something on the page. Even if you don't think it's specific enough, like do your best and then just really make sure your other questions are like solid, right? Because again, you're not trying to get all 100% of the potential points. You're trying to get like the majority of the points. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, what we're shooting for in this AP World History exam next week is like, if we're averaging getting around 70% of the points right, that's awesome. Awesome. So you can do that math in the multiple choice section. What's 70% of 55 questions? In the DBQ, that means if you're getting a four or five on the DBQ, you're doing a great job. So again, I think that the most important thing over this next week is to focus on the basics. Do not even think about complexity for the next week. Don't think about like, how can I get the super, super, super hard multiple choice questions right? Don't worry about those. Make sure you feel really confident in how to get like the medium ones right. Make sure that you like understand the broad developments of each era so that you're covering as much time and as many topics as possible. And that's what we're gonna go over in the second half in just a few minutes. Okay, this one is gonna lead us into some potential rabbit holes. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, we're not gonna go down them today. So I do wanna go over, I wanna show you my strategy for essays. And then we're just gonna move on because we could spend the next 25 minutes literally just talking about like a thesis statement. Again, go to this Marco Learning YouTube channel. There are tons of videos about what makes a good thesis statement. You can go to mine, anti-social studies, and you'll see some videos from 2020 that go through all the different points on the DVQ. So you can go find those. What I just wanted to show you, if you're nervous about the essay section, is that you really don't need to be that nervous. I actually think the essay section is the easiest part of this test, genuinely. Um, and that's even if you don't think you're a, quote, good writer, because you don't actually really have to be. So again, I want to make sure we're really clear. The rubrics for these essays are additive. What that means is I was a grader a few years ago on the DBQ. My only job is I'm looking for places to give you points. I'm not actually zooming out and assessing like the quality of your overall essay. I'm not going like, wow, they used some like beautiful metaphors. They had amazing transitions. None of that matters on the AP exam. What I'm looking for is like, where's your thesis? Great, you have it, check, right? And so again, try to make it as well organized as you can. Try to make it as well reasoned as you can, right? Because, I, but ultimately grammar doesn't matter. Spelling doesn't matter. Organization doesn't technically matter either, like do your best, right? But what this means is that for both these essays, next Thursday, Thursday, right? Yeah, next Thursday, these are rough drafts. What you're gonna be submitting on Thursday to the College Board is a rough draft of an essay. 
in a normal situation, you would submit the rough draft, you'd get feedback, you'd come back and make it so much more beautiful. We're just not doing that second step. And that makes students feel nervous because we don't like turning in work that we know maybe isn't like perfect or our best work, but that's just what it's gonna be on Thursday. And the thing I wanna make sure you know is that all the graders know that too. So if I'm grading your essay or if someone else is grading your essay, we're grading it as a rough draft as well. We don't expect it to be perfect. We don't expect it to be beautifully written. We're looking for the ideas. So essentially for both these essays, they just wanna know, can you make an argument and then defend it with evidence? So on the LEQ, the evidence is coming from your brain. You honestly, for each argument, need to have one or two solid pieces of evidence, right? That's it. And so again, the way I think of the LEQ is that it's basically just a few SAQs put together all on one theme, right? Um, the DBQ is kind of the same idea. It's just a little bit more complicated because you're getting your evidence to defend your thesis from these documents. So there are other things you can do with the documents too, right? You could use a document to defend your answer and then you could also evaluate the source, which is basically showing the college board that you understand that these documents aren't 100% truthful and factual, right? So in the same way, that you wouldn't like read a tweet from a politician and just be like, well, that must be 100% exactly what's happening right now. You get information from it. And then you also are like, well, but they're running for re-election and blah, blah, blah. So you can do that as an additional point. If you happen to know more evidence that beyond what the documents give you, you can bring that in as well. But the thing I just want to leave y'all with before we jump into content is to not, don't overthink it. I think one of the biggest problems, especially, frankly, if you're here, if you're watching this review on a Saturday, which I really appreciate, by the way, you are probably like prepared for this test. You've probably been reviewing. You are probably going to do more reviewing over this, this next week. So one of the biggest issues that I see from students who are smart, who've been paying attention in class, who have been reviewing, is they then just overthink it right? These LEQs, these DBQs, the SAQs, they're not asking you, even the multiple choice, they're not asking you about anything that you have not learned about in class, I promise, right? Any question, even if it seems at first super specific, is actually really just asking you about some bigger, broader development that I promise you, you know. And so again, I think the most important thing is just to like, don't panic and trust yourself, like, even if you're like, oh, I don't know if this is what they want. I don't know if this is a good piece of evidence. If it's coming to your brain, trust yourself and like put it on the page. And the worst case scenario is it's not relevant. And all I'll do is just skip it if I'm grading. That's all I'll do, right? It's not going to take points away from you. Okay, let's jump into, let me see. Oh, perfect. And we put in the chat too, a free practice test from Marco. That's awesome. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so let's jump into what you should be doing over the next week, right? If we are going into full like survival mode, like, okay, let's be strategic. The units you should be reviewing the most over the next week are units three through six. Three through six. Let me tell you why. First, I'll get out my little drawing tool. I forget I have that on here. It always makes me so excited. Okay, the first is that units one and two, 1200 to 1450, Notice they're only going to be like eight or 10% of the multiple choice questions. They will not be the topic of the DBQ. They've already told us that. They might be one option on the LEQ, but you can just choose one of the other two options. They might show up on an SAQ. So all you need to know about units one and two is just enough to answer a multiple choice question or to answer an SAQ. So frankly, if you haven't reviewed unit one and two at all, do it very briefly. I legitimately think if you just read the Marco study guide for units one and two, that's all you need. Seriously. The reason why also I don't think you need to do too much reviewing on 1900 to the present is just because I'm assuming that stuff is a little fresher in your memory, right? We tend to have an easier time with units seven through nine because it's stuff we're familiar with. We've all seen a Tom Hanks movie. We feel like we kind of understand the world war is the cold war. We all understand the internet because we're on it right now. And I'm assuming that that was recent. Like that's the stuff you just learned about in your class these last few months. So again, if, if, if you're uni if that's not you, if you're like, no, I don't understand unit eight at all. Great. Then review that. But what I'm saying is for the majority of students, the units that are the hardest for them 
and are also the most emphasized on the test are these two eras, these four units, 1450 to 1900. If I was reviewing, and frankly, when I'm reviewing with my own students next week, these are the only two eras I'm going to focus on in class, right? And especially being able to distinguish between these two eras. Because again, this is the biggest bulk of the test, right? So there's going to be a lot of multiple choice questions. There, there definitely will be at least one SAQ. There will probably be two options on the LEQ from this unit, most of these units most likely, um, and maybe the DBQ. And honestly, if you are feeling pretty solid, if you're a good writer, good enough to like get the points you need, one of the most common mistakes I see is students getting these two eras mixed up. So again, one of the things that I think would be really worth your time and I really like don't emphasize memorizing. I don't think memorizing for this test is very helpful. I do think memorizing these four years. So we're talking 1200, 1450, 1750, and 1900. And making sure you can distinguish between like what's going on in 1450, 1750, what's going on in the era before that, what's going on in the era after it. Because again, the worst thing that can happen is let's say you're asked to write an essay on 1450 to 1750, and then all your evidence comes from an earlier era. Well, you might've written a really good essay, but that's really the only way that you can like try and then really kind of screw it up, right? And so what I am encouraging my own students to do is memorize the eras well enough that you have just like a little framework in your brain where I kind of joke with them. I'm like, if I see you in the hallway next week and I yell at them, 1200 to 1450, then they should be able to list out like three to five things that are like the main idea of that era. So they would yell back, Silk Road, Song China, Dar al Islam, Mongols. I'd be like, great, right? And then again, that's all they know, but that's like their memorized thing to where when they get a question on the exam, they can be like, oh, right, I'm situating my brain in that era. If I yell 1450 to 1750, they'd go gunpowder empires, age of exploration. Great. Right. Um, again, we're going to go through these units, but I just wanted to mention that strategically, not every unit is equally important. Read the Marco study guide for units one and two. Read the Marco study guide for unit nine and then focus your time on three through eight. Assuming you kind of remember units seven and eight pretty well, really just focusing most of your time on three through six is going to like be give you the most bang for your buck. OK, with that. Let's go through a few of the eras. I want to show you how I would be studying over this next week. So what I would do to study over this next week is I would just make sure, if nothing else, you know the big idea of each time period and you know the main civilizations of that time period. And you're, what, I'm, what you're doing is that then you're hoping, right, that your brain will kind of start to make some of the connections and remember some of the details or be able to figure it out based on the documents they give you. So these like little graphics on the side, these Senate um, overviews are from my Instagram. So if you want, I mean, you can obviously like screenshot it here. You can also go find, I just posted it on my Instagram again this year, just this morning, anti-social studies. So again, what I would do is make sure that you kind of remember, okay, 1200, 1450, it's powerful states are expanding regional trade routes. That's the big idea. That's the thesis statement for this era. And then I want to think about, have sort of this mind map of like, what are all the different ways they're doing that? So what are the most powerful states? We're talking about the Song Dynasty in China. We're talking about Dar al-Islam around the Middle East and kind of Indian Ocean world. Um, we're talking about Mali and these West African trading kingdoms um, and then these Southeast Asian trading states, right? And then we're talking about how they are like innovating and promoting things that are helping trade routes expand. And also as trade routes expand, they are getting more power, right? The best example of this is the Mongols, right? The best example is the Mongols that become this massively powerful state and their goal is to control this trade route of the Silk Road. And so then by controlling it, they help foster innovation and they help foster like peace and security to where that trade route expands. 
The other thing you'd want to note is if there's a major exception to this. So in this era, the major exception is uh, medieval Europe, right? So you would want to take note of like, hey, most of the world in Africa and Asia is in their golden era, innovation, the house of wisdom, universities in the song, Timbuktu and Mali, and they are actively promoting trade, cultural diffusion, spread of religion, new languages, innovation, math, science. And then you go, hey, that's weird. Medieval Europe is not doing that. Medieval Europe is trying to come out of its Middle Ages, but the church is kind of suppressing and limiting knowledge, right? They are much more isolated from trade. When they do start to get reconnected to trade, they have things like the Black Death. So again, noticing like big major themes and examples, and then any notable exceptions to that kind of general rule, right? And again, if you're not sure where to start, if you're not sure what the big ideas are, here, I'm giving them to you now. On my YouTube channel, I have unit intros. So for each unit, for unit one, I'll say, here are the three big questions you should be able to answer from unit one. Um, and then also Marco Learning Study Guide goes into it. So what I suggest for students is a nice little cocktail of like, let's say you're gonna study, let's do unit three, because I just told y'all unit three through six are the most important. So let's say you wanted to study units three and four, what I would do is I would hop over to my YouTube channel, Antisocial Studies, and watch my unit three and four intro videos. They're each like eight minutes. Then I would read the Marco Learning Study Guide. That's like a step, a step more in terms of detail. Then if there's any part of that unit that you still don't understand or don't feel like you have enough detail on, then you can go over to our friend Steve Heimler and like watch one of his like deep dive videos. But I, you don't need to do that for every single one. Again, I would start with those like big picture unit intros. So again, you might see my unit intro being like, hey, for unit three, you want to know what are the ways that land-based empires are growing and what are the ways that their rulers are asserting and consolidating their power? That's the main question, right? Then you go to the Marco study guide to read their two-page summary and kind of organize it according to those questions I gave you. Then if there's one section, maybe it mentions the Protestant Reformation and you're like, I still don't really understand how that fits into this unit. Then you hop over to our friend Steve Heimler and you watch his video on that. That's what I would be doing over the next week. That to me is the most efficient way to study um, because you're doing it purposefully. One of the biggest mistakes that students make is they just basically like hope that through osmosis, if they just keep YouTube up and they literally just play every single AP World video and just like, in their sleep even, that they'll just kind of naturally learn that stuff. It's not really the way the brain works. You have to be actively seeking information. So that's why I would start with the big idea and then say, okay, what else do I need to know to fully explain this big thing? Then go seek the information and you're gonna remember it way more easily. And also you'll like, it's gonna take less time, right? Okay, so I just mentioned that I think units three through six are the most important. So let's talk really, really briefly. And again, let's kind of use that strategy right here. So 1450 to 1750, you wanna be thinking about why did the college board use the dates they did? Why did they say 1450 is when one era ends and another one begins? And so for each of these, it's always nice to maybe be able to point to a few events that are kind of why the college board did this. So for 1450, we have two things. 1453 is when the Ottomans conquer Constantinople. And then the one we all know is 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? So again, these are the two dates where they kind of rounded down and were like, okay, around 1450-ish, right? So again, if you can kind of remember those events maybe, that kind of clues you in. Because if you remember these two events, then guess what? You can infer the entire unit because this entire era is about gunpowder empires of which the Ottomans are the first major one. That's partly how they conquered the Byzantines was through gunpowder. And it's the age of exploration and the rise of Europe, right? That's what this era is all about. Um, so again, rising European maritime empires competed with Asian and African states. So you would go, okay, what's happening in Europe? Um, we would hop over to our AP World Study Guide pack and we would skim through their unit three and four pages. Where is it? Here we go. Okay. Empires are expanding and I would skim through and go, oh, right, gunpowder, gunpowder empires. Here's some of the ones we want to know about. Here's a nice little map they've given us. 
oh, right. How are empower these growing empires administering their empire? They're using kind of like recruited soldiers, professional soldiers like Dev Shirme, the samurai. They're using religion still, divine right of kings. They're building things like Versailles, the Taj Mahal. They're taxing, they're improving their taxing. Um, oh, right. We have like belief systems in conflict right now. We have a lot of Sunni Shia wars. We have Protestant Catholic wars. Um, that's going on. And then I'd go, oh, right. And then for the age of exploration, we have navigational technology, discover the Americas. We're kind of like the Columbian exchange between the two. Um, and then this is maybe the part, if it were me, I'd go, oh, okay. I don't remember this step as well. So if I was a student, I would skim through this and go, oh, right. I don't actually, okay. This is a little bit harder for me. Right. So I would say, great. So we have these European maritime empires being established, Spain and Portugal, and eventually the British and Dutch and French in the new world, Portugal and Dutch in the Indian Ocean. But we also want to know how is Africa and Asia responding? And so I might skim and go, oh, the Ashanti Empire, I don't remember much about them. Um, maybe I look through and I'm like, I don't remember a lot of these revolts. Well, that's when I would go find an in-depth video about these. Uh, Freemanpedia is a great resource. Heimler Sister is a great resource. On, um, for some of these, I've done a deep dive video. That's where you might go back into your book or go back into your notes only for the parts of this that you're like, oh, I don't actually remember very much about this, right? That's how I would review each era. Okay. Um, all right. We have eight minutes left. I'm going to try to, um, mm -mm -mm. I'm going to try to get through the last, the last few eras if I can, but especially this one. Okay. Most students, the most common mistake is getting these two eras confused, 1450 to 1750 and 1750 to 1914. And that's fair because what's happening in these two eras is a lot of continuity. What that means is a lot of things that were established in like the 1450 era are just growing and becoming more intense and more interconnected in this era. So it is easy for students to be like, wait, when was the scramble for Africa? Which one was it? Or when was, um, I don't know, the, um, the Japanese and their like industrialization? Like it's easy to kind of get these confused. So here's what I want you, where am I? Here's what I want you to think about. Okay. What's happening right now in 1450 to 1750 is that you still have very powerful, big empires and they are using new technology to establish their control. This most straightforward new technology is gunpowder, right? But also new navigational technology to build bigger empires, to build bigger connections. And what you wanna think about is that this is when Europe is on the rise. So powerful land-based empires in Africa and Asia have been important and powerful. They were important and powerful in the last era. That's a continuity. China is still crushing it. The Middle East still crushing it. Even West African trading states still crushing it. What's happening and what's changing is the rise of Europe. So this is the era where Europe is kind of like catching up, but they're doing it in a different way. They're doing it by developing maritime empires, meaning like overseas empires. They're starting to develop some early forms of what we would consider kind of the enlightenment um, in within Europe, maybe slightly more representative governments sometimes, but not always. Right. And they're doing it by gaining access to goods abroad that they don't have at home. And so Europe is first going to achieve dominance in the Americas. They can't compete with Africa and Asia yet. They cannot conquer Africa and Asia yet. They don't have enough power to do that. This whole era is about Europe trying to get equal to these African Asian trading states. That were already that were established kind of in the last era, right? So again, remember the whole reason they discover quote unquote the Americas is to try to get to Asia a new way. And then even when they find the Americas, their biggest concern is what can we take from here and sell in the Indian Ocean? That's still their main goal for this whole era, right? And so again, um, we have this sort of like competing interest of like these new arrivals in the Indian Ocean, these new arrivals in Africa and Asia. The Europeans are not more powerful than other states. They're just now back on the same footing. That changes in 1750. 1750 to 1900 
is when sort of this is this like European golden age, right? Where we have a few things that occur right around 1750 that are going to give Europe the upper hand. Those things are, um, let me think, I think it's like 1760 something is the steam engine gets like perfected by James Watt, a Scottish inventor. And of course we know 1776 is the Declaration of Independence. It's also interestingly the same year that Adam Smith writes his Wealth of Nations that kind of founds the idea of capitalism. So these are three events that really give us some insight into like how was the Western world able to rise to dominance? So again, in the last era, we have sort of the world is split into two. It's split into like the Indian Ocean world and the Atlantic Ocean world, and they're starting to come together. In this era is when we get the Western world, Europe and the United States fully dominating everyone else. This is when we get full-scale imperialism in Africa and parts of Asia. This is when we get um, China falling apart, unable to really respond to the new industrial power of Britain. So this is this era of like revolutions. This is also this era of industrialization. And again, in the same way in the last era that like new technologies of like gunpowder and navigation allow Europe to set up their maritime empires, in this era, industrialization allows them to like go into these continents that were very powerful and like subjugate them, right? So this is what we're talking about, you know, steam engines, steam ships, machine guns, railroads. And we end by the end of this time period, we have Ethiopia and we have India under the direct control of, control of Britain. We have China kind of divided up into their spheres of influence. We still have the Ottomans hanging on, but remember they're the sort of sick man of Europe. A lot of the Ottoman territories have been inspired by the enlightenment and nationalism to try to start breaking away, right? Um, and this era kind of ends essentially when World War I begins. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there as far as content review. Um, because I know we have another review session happening in about 15 minutes. And so I just want to sort of wrap up. Um, I am going to post this PowerPoint for free on my website. So I will immediately go post it on antisocialstudies.org. You'll just go to Classroom Resources AP World History. You'll see a lot of other resources I have too. So I've given you lots of stuff here that are for free. So like um, let's see, I've given you a simplified course exam, like overview. Um, I've given you a lot of links to podcast episodes that I've done, deep dives that I've done. I will post this PowerPoint I'm presenting right now, right here on this AP World History page. Um, so anyone can go find it and check it out for later. You should definitely follow the link. I think it's in the description of this video um, to go download this study guide. It's free. So go to Marco Learning, you'll see the free study guide and you can download it. This is going to be a really helpful resource over the next week. And again, make sure that you're subscribed to this channel, to Marco Learning on Instagram and TikTok and me on Instagram and TikTok, because that's where we're going to be announcing lots of things. So I'm going to be going live again on this channel right here the night before the AP exam. But I'm also going to be doing a lot of stuff on TikTok as well. You can go to my TikTok account right now and there's a whole playlist called AP World History. And I'm not joking. It's the whole course. It's 1200 all the way up to 2001 through TikToks. So you can just start that playlist and you'll get kind of the big idea. Um, so again, keep following um, all of those and we'll announce like any other, any other last minute reviews we're doing. I'm also gonna give my sort of predictions like I did for APUSH, what I think would be good essay prompts. Um, I'm going to go back through and look at like all the previous essay prompts they've asked over the last five years or so. So I'll be posting that on my Instagram page soon within the next day or two. Um, so in the meantime, please like this video, please share it with your friends. This recording will be available on their channel forever. And so if there are any friends who didn't come to this or weren't able to make it, share it with them or share it with your teachers. Um, so that they can let more students kind of benefit from this. And then I will see you soon. I'm going to be going live with Heimler in a few days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then back with Marco Learning right after that on Wednesday night. Y'all are going to do great. You're already doing the right thing by being here. Good luck and stick around. Yeah, you should check out the schedule of events. Basically all day on this channel, they're going to be doing AP exam reviews. So if you're taking any other AP classes, like stick around and make sure you check out what other videos they have. All right, cool. Thanks.